Hello, welcome to Scholars Hub at Home. I'm Allison Gampel, Associate Director of Alumni Programs at York University. Thank you for joining us today for the key to equity and inclusion in online classrooms, lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. As this event is virtual and we're not all gathered in the same space, I do recognize that the following land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you're currently on. If this is the case, please take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you're on and its current treaty holders. The website nativeland.ca is a really great resource for this. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tuckeronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lake region. I'm grateful to live and work on this land. Before we introduce our speaker today, I'd like to give you a quick update. If this is your first Scholars Hub event of the season, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to the 2021-22 academic year. I'm happy to announce that York safely reopened our campuses earlier this month, and many of the activities that we've missed over the past 18 months, from in-person classes to extracurricular activities to just getting together to chat have resumed. The most up-to-date university planning information can always be found on our Better Together website, at yorku.ca forward slash better together. So we like to get to know our audience a bit better with a quick poll before each lecture. So today's question is, how would you rate your knowledge regarding the topic of today's presentation? So it's popped up on your screen and I'll give everyone just a quick moment to respond. Great. Thanks everyone for participating. It's really helpful for us to have an idea about who's here and what knowledge you have coming into each lecture. Uh, on the tech side, if you need any help with this Zoom webinar, please feel free to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, and we've got a team in the background that's ready to help you. That same button can be used to submit questions for our guest speaker during the Q&A period that will follow the presentation. For our friends who are watching live on Facebook, please feel free to submit any questions or comments in the comments section for the video. And again, our team in the background will send them my way. Please do note that all your questions and comments are visible to our panelists and staff working behind the scenes. So please keep your comments relevant and respectful. So today's talk. Today's talk will feature Dr. Sarah Barrett. Dr. Sarah Barrett is an associate protector, an associate professor, pardon me, at York University's Faculty of Education. Her research focuses on the values and beliefs that teachers bring to their practice. Currently, she's studying teachers' experiences of emergency distance, learn, distance teaching during the COVID-19 pandemic. As a parent of school-age children myself, I am super excited to be here and to learn from Sarah's research because I believe I was living it from, uh, from, from my own living room. So welcome, Dr. Sarah, Dr. Sarah Barrett. We are delighted to have you here. You can turn on your camera and kick off your presentation. Hi, everyone. My sound all right? Your sound is great. So I'll let you share and uh, I will leave and I'll see you back after you give your talk. Thanks so much for being here. Fantastic. So hi everyone and thank you so much for attending this session and I'd also like to thank the alumni and friends of York University for inviting me to do this talk. I'm actually going to ask you to do another poll because I just wanted to get an idea of how many parents are out there and also how many educators. So I'm just going to put a poll there and you have three choices, parent or teacher or both. Thank you so much. This is really helpful. Because like a lot of professors, I um, actually, I should start out sharing my screen here. There we go. So 
like a lot of professors, I really enjoy delivering lectures because it's great to vibe with a group of people on an interesting topic. And of course, I appreciate the opportunity to share my research. And it's especially a privilege when the attendees have chosen to be there. Of course, this is a little different. I can't see you, so no body language or facial expressions for me to respond and adjust to. In fact, it's a bit like talking to a wall. It is really difficult to tell if I'm meeting your needs. I'm assuming that you're well-fed, that you're in an environment conducive to concentration, that you have the equipment and the bandwidth to attend and be able to participate fully. I assume you are psychologically present and socially safe enough to concentrate. And you are adults, so you have the means to make adjustments if my presentation isn't quite what you needed. You have the wherewithal to either adjust or ask me to adjust. And frankly, the stakes are low. This is a recreational thing for all of us. But it wouldn't be so easy if you were a group of young people in my class in the K to 12 system, otherwise known as elementary and secondary schools, because not only would your age reduce your ability to make adjustments, but my responsibility to you as your teacher would be heightened. K to 12 teachers aren't just expected to teach their students, they're expected to take care of them. And some students need more support than others because of their abilities, circumstances, or attitudes. And we know that students from marginalized groups need the most if we are, if our aim is to create equitable and inclusive classrooms. And yet, if you were a group of K to 12 students, I would still be effectively staring at a brick wall. You know, before becoming a professor, I was a high school chemistry teacher and my goal was to help every student in my class to love chemistry as much as I love it. And different students needed different things to reach that outcome. But the techniques and approaches that I used to ensure an equitable and inclusive classroom don't necessarily work in online environments. So what I want to talk to you about today is what my own research confirms is the key to maintaining equity and inclusivity in online learning environments. But first, I just want to describe the study to you. So I did a survey of Ontario teachers. It was more than 750 of them that um, responded, um, and I was asking about their personal and professional contexts, professional development, and student outcomes. And then I did interviews with a subgroup of those respondents, 50 of them, and talked to them about teaching approaches, orientation to teaching in general and online, assessments, relationships with students, colleagues, and parents. And so my purpose was to understand how the teachers had experienced the shift or what we have tended lately to call the pivot from in-person to emergency distance teaching. And I should say that what happened in the spring of 2020 was not what I would call online learning. Again, it was emergency distance learning. I make the distinction because in Ontario, prior to March 13th, 2020, Teachers were not expecting to be teaching online. Students were not prepared for it either. And the situation was unique. Uh, there was the pandemic, lockdown, protests, economic devastation for many. Plus, the Minister of Education decreed that grades could not go down from when, wherever they were on March 13th. So this was not a typical situation, but it was a crisis and crises highlight aspects of ordinary situations that we may not have paid attention to otherwise. Plus, the province of Ontario is mandating that students must take courses online to graduate from high school. So although my study took place during an extraordinary time, it did highlight aspects of online learning that we need to keep in mind moving forward. I would also like to point out that when we are talking about distance learning, emergency or otherwise, it is really easy to fall into the trap of focusing too much on the teacher's efficiency. Distance learning is more than just efficient delivery of curriculum content 
and efficient evaluation of student learning. Distance learning is something that students do and not all students have the wherewithal to do it without supports. So I wanna define some terms ahead of time so that we're all on the same page. When I say inclusive, I mean that the classroom is a space where all of the students feel that they are welcome, regardless of circumstances, abilities, or demographic categories. When I say equitable, I mean conditions that allow everyone equal access to participate, which means each person may be given something different in order to achieve this. And when I say marginalized students, I mean identifiable groups of students who don't automatically fit in. In my study, according to my participants, it was students with physical or learning disabilities or mental health issues, students living in poverty, students who were working class, indigenous and racialized students, adult students who had never completed high school, English language learners and refugees. And there are other groups that would qualify for this label, but this list represents the ones that were mentioned by the 50 interviewees. It is the marginalized students to whom teachers aim to create equity and inclusion because it isn't automatic for them. So, and you know, spoiler alert, the antidote for marginalization is community. Every good teacher knows this, either unconsciously or consciously. They know that marginalized students need community in order to be successful academically and socially, and to be physically and psychologically healthy. And in person, teachers know what they need to do in order for the classroom community to flourish. But they may or may not be able to articulate what that is and what Sorry, they may or may not be able to articulate what that is. And it may be uh, difficult to translate that to the online environment. So what I'm going to do today is break it down. What creates community? So there are four aspects. Community requires sense of belonging, trust, shared purpose, and high quality interaction. Sense of belonging refers to students feeling that they are amongst friends and enjoy spending time together. Further, there is a sense that it is safe not only to nurture each other, but to challenge each other too. Trust is a feeling that one can rely on other students in the class and be assured that classmates care about and would not lie to one. Trust creates feelings of safety so that students can express themselves freely. Shared purpose relates to a shared sense of what the class is trying to achieve academically. And high quality interaction focuses on the nature of both student-student and student-teacher interactions being conducive to all of the above. So these aspects of community are necessary in any context, in person or online. But again, we have to be deliberate about it, creating it in an online environment. So I'm going to provide some examples and counterexamples from some of the teachers that I interviewed. So for sense of belonging, one of the teachers, Elise, taught in a special ESL program or English as a second language program for refugees. And she said, I'm old enough to break the rules. And so I did what I wasn't supposed to do and was able to connect with my students, both in terms of how to get them online and the fact that I met with them every day at a certain time and Fridays at a certain time. We changed that Friday time because the boys had to pray at that time. Now, by adjusting the class schedule to accommodate the students' religious practice, rather than simply excusing the students who did Friday prayers from class, Elise was sending a strong mes message of inclusion, where it was not just the case that she was accommodating them, but that all students were accommodating each other. Contrast that with another teacher who taught vocal music. She arranged for an open mic night, an activity online, and many students participated and enjoyed it. 
and supported each other. So community was reinforced, but students who did not have the means to be online couldn't participate. For those marginalized students, sense of belonging would have been absent in that activity. But it wasn't just a matter of not having the means to connect. Many students simply chose not to attend. You may know that grades could not go down after March 13th and when the schools closed and many students decided not to participate once that announcement was made. But who made that choice to stay away and why? Elisa's students did show up. The students who had the means showed up for that open mic night. The efforts of these two teachers to create a sense of belonging, however imperfect, had an effect. But how about trust, the second aspect of community? Recall that trust is a feeling that one can rely on other students in the class. A high school social sciences teacher described the effect of trust this way. If a person can create in their classroom a structure of trust and inside the structure is the warmth of loving each other, then people will take risks. And the kids who felt the most protected, the most comfortable were the ones that stayed. So he recognized that the few students who were showing up to class, in spite of the fact that their grades could not go down, were the ones who felt safe. But Gordon also was teaching a group of highly motivated grade 12 students. In other situations, a teacher might be working with a class that was mostly marginalized students. For example, Kendra, a special education resource teacher in an elementary school, taught a class of autistic students. And she said, we've worked so hard to establish and build in that level of trust. We're dealing with non-neurotypical kids. That trust for them is huge. If they don't trust you and you don't have that relationship with them, you can program all you want. It doesn't mean that you're going to get through to them. In fact, we know that several school boards decided that the loss of any ground gained socially or academically with special education students was too much for some. So during the school closures that happened in Ontario in January, 2021, in some of the districts in which my participants teach, the decision was made to still run certain special education classes in person. Although frankly, there's no evidence that this was because of a recognition of the importance of community. Rather, it seems to indicate a recognition of a lack of academic progress. Don't get me wrong, I know that a major function of schooling is academic, but the social aspect of schooling is fundamental to that because it creates the conditions necessary for learning. If students feel that they belong, that they can trust each other and the teacher, then they can have a shared purpose, which is the next necessary aspect of community. And I'll remind you that shared purpose relates to a shared sense of what the class is trying to achieve academically. One participant worked in a mostly working class community where many of the students were choosing between making some extra money and going to school. Remember, their grades couldn't go down, so there was no apparent consequence. So this participant said, as long as that student had an okay grade at their midterm mark, and unless they're going to a post-secondary institution next year where they felt that they needed that learning in order to continue moving on, it was hard to give them reasoning as to why it would be beneficial to them when they could be off earning money to go to college or their internship. So the shared purpose of learning for the sake of learning was miss, was missing, and their academic community fell apart because the students hadn't, uh, well, because the students had other priorities. And how do you deal with that? Well, it's hard to know what could have been done during the pandemic, but in normal circumstances, explicitly talking about the aims of the course with the students and getting buy-in from them by talking about their personal goals is one way to create a sense of shared purpose, especially if the teacher routinely calls back to that initial discussion throughout the course. Finally, and this one feels obvious, but it is also easy to take for granted, and that is high quality interactions. High quality interaction focuses on the nature of both student-student and student-teacher interactions being conducive to sense of belonging, 
trust, and shared purpose. And every teacher who participated in the study found that although there were exceptions with individual students, the quality of interactions with students was not high. Indeed, this was especially difficult for younger students. An elementary teacher put it this way. I took a picture each week of a new flower that was in my garden and told them about it and sent them the picture. And so every week they looked forward to what the new flower was in my garden and they would draw a picture of it and send it back to me. But that's not a deep connection, really. And in fact, almost all of the teachers commented that even when they were able to maintain connections with students, that connection felt shallow. To create the space for high quality interactions online, teachers need to create opportunities for students to work with each other and one-on-one -on -one with their teacher. It can be synchronous or asynchronous, but it must be meaningful and it needs to happen throughout the course. And it's okay for a teacher to be explicit and say, look, Research shows that people learn better in an environment where they have quality time with their classmates and teacher. How shall we do that? Do you have suggestions? I've done this myself, and it not only gives the teacher ideas, but it also adds to shared purpose. But the circumstances of the pandemic really didn't allow for that. The result was that in the case of most of the teachers in the study, after it became clear that their grades would not go down, the marginalized students simply never returned to the online class. So, community requires sense of belonging, trust, shared purpose, and high quality interaction. We know this. We also know that marginalized students require community. And although most students got through the school closures and managed, we know that the students who suffered most during school closures were the ones who were already vulnerable. They got left behind. David, an elementary teacher, described the frustrations of many teachers in this way. I didn't like the idea of being told, listen, you can't do it for all the kids, do it for as many as you can. I don't like that because I wanna teach all the kids and nobody should be left behind. And so to effectively be told, cut your losses, if you can get 20, that's great. Yes, but those nine, they might need me. So I never want to do that again if I can possibly help it. So looking forward, Ontario is instituting a requirement that all students take two courses online to graduate from high school. Teacher-directed online learning is expanding in Ontario from K to 12. And asynchronous, mostly independent online learning is being expanded as well. So the issues that were exacerbated during the pandemic are ongoing and high stakes. So in conclusion, if you will indulge me, I'm stepping up on my soapbox. We know what happened in the spring of 2020 and the winter of 2021 was extraordinary, but we also know that it could happen again. So A, we need to prepare for it. And B, we need to give students who have experienced systemic disruption after systemic disruption over the last 18 months, time to readjust and catch up and find the social and academic footing again. Currently, the measures that the Ministry of Education is instituting to help students catch up are highly individualized. And it isn't fair to take a systemic problem like a global pandemic and make recovery from it rest on the shoulders of individuals, especially the most vulnerable ones. The system needs to create the conditions for students to recover academically and socially. So as we move forward, we need to remember that the key to equitable and inclusive online classrooms is community. We already know how to create it in person, given the time, and we need to reproduce it online because a community that intentionally creates a sense of belonging, trust, shared purpose and high quality interactions doesn't leave the most vulnerable people behind to fend for themselves. Okay, stepping down from my soapbox. Thank you so much for listening. I so wish I could see you, but I thank you for your time and attention. This is the article here that this talk was based on. 
and it is part of a special issue of the Journal of Teaching and Learning on the effects of the pandemic school closures on youth, and it is freely available online. Thank you all. Dr. Barrett, thank you so much uh, for being here and for sharing all of this important um, you know, information and insight. My head is sort of swimming as I'm trying to sort of apply it to my own children, you know, one who's in grade six and one who just started high school. And um, you know, there's so much to process and to think about. So um, you, you've really personally sort of opened my mind to some of the, the challenges and struggles. And I'm, I'm really grateful for, for you doing that. Um, there are, there's an opportunity for our guests to ask questions. So uh, to our guests who are in the audience, please feel free to um, type any questions that you have in the Q&A, and then I will ask them to Dr. Barrett on your behalf. Um, and, um, and there we have it. So as people are writing in their questions, I'll start with, uh, with the first question that, uh, that just um, came up. Could you talk uh, a bit more about what you mean by systemic versus individualistic approaches to helping students regain their academic and social footing post-COVID? Sure, and there has been, and the Ministry of Education should be lauded for this. They have gone out of their way to create ways for students who need a little extra time, who um, fell behind during the pandemic and during the school closures to sort of move back in sync with sort of the original timelines for schooling. Um, and so they made EQAO testing um, optional, for example, for some students, they allowed um, exams not necessarily to happen. They uh, put in some extra money for um, more special education resources, et cetera. All of that is great, but it's all based on helping individual students who are having troubles. What that does though, is it sort of widens the gap because there are students <clears throat> who were able to get this, this help privately ahead of time. There are students who didn't need the extra help because they had more resources at home, for example. Um, and so what ends up happening is you end up with this sort of uneven situation. If you look at it systemically though, there are ways that you can deal with it. And let's just look at standardized testing, for example. If you're going to say that we're in a situation where it may not be fair to test a student with a standardized test, and what you can say is, well, why don't we just use a standardized test to evaluate the system as opposed to the students? Maybe this doesn't have to count for individuals. Um, this is just not the time for us to be making those comparisons because they wouldn't be fair comparisons. However, we can use the information to sort of look at the system and go, okay, what's, what's happened here? We can compare this to the time before the pandemic happened. So that's what I mean. Like, if we're going to deal with a systemic problem, we need to deal with it systemically and not individually. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, it makes me think of, of, one of one of my children who has some accommodations and they used to get extra time to take a test. And then when the pandemic hit and we moved, and I love the distinction that you made between um, online learning versus emergency distance learning. Um, and, and that really rang, rang true because the accommodation that happened instead of taking more time, um, my child had the opportunity to simply answer the questions that they wanted to answer. So the evaluation, became totally different. Um, so in a situation like that, where these emergency measures were put into place, I mean, how does this impact, you know, long-term individual and systemic success in, in school, success in life? You know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the first thing I'd say is that students are always adaptable. I mean, that's one of the features of youth, right? Um, and teachers are also adaptable. You know, once they have their students in front of them, they were able to modify what they need to modify in their teaching in order to make sure that everybody gets what they need. What they can't control is time, right? So we need to give them the time to do that. We need to sort of remove some of the sort of pressures on them. Um, standardized tests do impose some pressure, right? Um, which we need to sort of relieve a bit. We also need to give the teachers the sort of flexibility to make the changes they need to make because they know what they need to do. This is part of their job. They meet the students and they go, well, this is what I need to do to catch them up. Um, so all of that has to, basically we have to create space for the teachers to do their job. We have to create space for students to catch up, quote unquote. And I say, quote unquote, because it isn't a matter of we need to stuff all this information in them that they missed. It's more a matter of we need to recognize where the students are in, in their sort of academic journey 
and help them so that they can go to where they want to go next. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a question that's coming in from uh, from Eleanor, who's saying, uh, as a high school teacher, currently on mat leave. Congratulations, Eleanor. Um, I'm concerned that many parents and other taxpayers don't realize the impact of funding class size, etc., on students. Do you have ideas of how teachers and our unions can help increase public awareness of the reality that learning conditions are working conditions? Um, this person feels like we're often under the current government fighting for the resources, um, and then there's low support for, for teachers and school funding. So can you can you comment on the external circumstances? Sure, and it's, uh, I mean, the first thing I would say is, if somebody isn't recognizing that a teacher's work sort of uh, environment isn't the same thing as the learning environment of their students, and they're not wanting to see that. I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's a classroom. You're all in the same room. If you're not recognizing that, it, it's, a, it's a political question, right? It's not about information. It's, uh, shall I say, ideology, ideological. Um, but once you identify that, then you have to deal with it on that level, right? So it's not a matter of, do we, do we need to show them information? It's a matter of, we need to figure out why they're not seeing this, right? Um, that's another question. What I would say, though, is that research is, is very uh, explicit on this, that parents rarely have anything against their own kids' teachers. They use, they, if they have something against teachers, it's teachers writ large, but rarely their own students' teachers because they actually see through their kids what the teachers are doing. So that's something that teachers should take heart in, but it is a very strategic thing. Like You have to be very, you're going to have to be strategic as educators in helping people to understand what's going on. I would say that parents are most are the most likely to understand what's happening in the classroom in the populace because they have their child in that class. And so it's the parents that you need to talk to and it's the parents that then influence the government and then the government gives the extra funding. Thank you for that. So let's move on to the to the idea of community. You, you know, you talked about about that a lot. Um, so are you saying that if a student is struggling due to structural issues like poverty or refugee status, that all they need is to feel part of a classroom community, whether it's online or in person, in order to succeed? Oh, absolutely not. So community is important. Um, community is necessary because um, because when students were marginalized, that's just one more thing they, would, they have to deal with that gets in the way of learning. Um, however, structural issues need to be dealt with structurally. So sort of follows from the last question. You have to figure out what is underlying it and then that helps you decide what to do. However, if students feel like they're part of a community, then they're more likely to sort of ask for the help that they need. Um, they're more likely to accept the help that the teacher gives the larger community within the classroom is more likely to support each other. And then it becomes something that everybody's working on. But the community in the classroom will never be enough to fix a structural issue. All, all they're doing is compensating. But it's way easier to compensate as a group than it is if it's just the individual child. So, you know, when, when we think about community, I feel like there's only so much, there's, there's a community that can be created within a classroom, but at least prior to the pandemic, um, children had the benefits of all of their other communities that were part of their extracurriculars, whether it was their bands or their, you know, GSA clubs or their athletic um, groups. And a lot of that, um, you know, ceased to exist and wasn't seen, I don't know, I guess it was seen as, as not imperative to the learning journey um, and it still seems to be as I look at my own kids slow to come back though I see little tricklings um, how, how does that and the extracurricular communities you know play into everyone's success and experience yeah and it's interesting how you say that because a lot of the interviewees mentioned that as one of the things they truly missed about teaching when they were separated from their students physically it wasn't just that they weren't in their own classroom with them it's like I didn't get to see them in the hallway and talk to them and ask how they're doing or be in the cafeteria and just sort of wander around and chat with students. The students weren't able to interact informally. Um, they weren't able to, you know, just 
have their sort of inside jokes that they would that they would have in the class. Um, there were so many things that are just not part of content delivery that were no longer there. And almost every teacher said that this was a problem because this not only did it make it harder for the students to be part of a community, but it made it harder for the teachers because part of why they enjoy teaching is being in this sort of communion with their students and with the larger school. So it really was a problem. And it is something that if we're going to continue doing more and more teaching online, we need to recognize because every, and I've, I said this in the talk, every teacher knows that community is important. And yet the structure of online teaching can make you forget that, that that is actually still an important part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I'm trying to remember the timeline because life pre-pandemic seems like, you know, eons ago, but I remember that there was also some, um, I don't know, labor issues pre-pandemic that prevented extracurriculars from emerging. So as I think about my kids, I feel like they've actually not benefited from extracurriculars for what feels like a really, really long time with little snippets of, of getting it, um, which impacts the community experience beyond the classroom. Any mm -hmm. The thought on, on, on that and, you know, what, what will come back, what needs to come back? Well, all I would say to that is that I think that teachers will always make sure that they're going to create community in person. So that's going to be there regardless. Um, again, online, it's more, it's more difficult and they really have to think hard about how it's going to work, but, but they will do that. As for extracurriculars and you know contract disputes, et cetera, I mean teachers are adults, so they are frontline workers, and they have a right to, you know, have a collective agreement that that works for them and for their students. And so I don't think it's my place to comment on that because that you know it's, it's their it's their careers, it's their working conditions, it's their students' learning conditions. I don't think that I'm in a place where I could comment. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask a question that's coming in for Arlene, who is who says, um, thank you for your compelling presentation. And I agree wholeheartedly. Um, and then Arlene is asking about teacher training. How have we adjusted the teacher training program at York in light of this distance emergency learning and teaching? So a lot of changes had to happen because of uh, our students, of course, have their practicum and um, that was very much affected. That is the place where most of the change has happened. I know for me, I teach um, people that are going to be science teachers um, when they're done our program. And I have, I have been focusing mostly on getting the fundamentals of how people learn and how to develop good lesson planning and, and program planning, because that's the foundation for how well you teach online. All the technical stuff, I mean, that will depend on the platform that you're using, the equipment that you have, what the students have. And those are things that they're smart enough to figure out later. It's way more important from my perspective when I'm teaching a methods course that they understand the foundational stuff. How do students learn? What are the characteristics of students? How do you do a compelling program and lesson? Thank you. Um, you've spoken about what's necessary for community to exist. Can you comment on some of the techniques that teachers might use to create community within online classrooms? Right, and in online, I mean, a lot of people have been using Zoom. Um, so I'm just gonna use that as an example. Um, and I'm sure this is true of, of other platforms. Using a lot of breakout rooms, like making the groups smaller so that there's more chance of students being able to interact with each other is very important um, because in the larger group, it's a lot harder to do. A big problem, of course, is that a lot of students don't want to turn on their cameras, which is really hard as an instructor because you can't see your students. And it's weird, right? Because we're used to seeing body language, at least. Um, what you can do and what I do, actually, is I actually talk to the class at the beginning. It's like, OK, it, it, I can't tell you to turn on your camera because it's your house. I'm not going to make you do that. But can we talk about how we're going to be able to interact with each other? Like, how will you be able to show me that you're participating? How will you show somebody when you're talking to them that you're, that you're listening to them? And, and we brainstormed and talked about it so that the students were more aware of the fact that they do still need to convey to the people that they're talking to that they're listening, that they're interested, or 
that they want to contribute something. So that I think is really important. Um, and, and essentially just globally, be really explicit about what you're trying to do. And don't be afraid to ask your students to contribute to trying to figure out how to make it work. So you come in as an, as an educator knowing these are the four things I need to make sure are there. But you don't have to invent everything. If you get the students involved, then that also becomes part of community building. That's absolutely fantastic um, piece of advice. Uh, and, and maybe my final question is, um, as, as a parent, um, are there things that parents can be doing to, you know, shy of forcing their kids to keep their camera on and going in and checking that they're not Minecraft in the background? Um, are there things that, that parents can do to help the teachers do what they're trying to do with, within their classrooms, whether it's online or in person? Right. Well, and of course, this was, this was a big problem during the pandemic. Parents, you know, they're not necessarily in a position to be standing over their child's shoulder and seeing what's going on. But I think that a really important thing for parents is to recognize and understand that the teacher is juggling a lot of things when they're trying to teach a course online. Like I, I think I said to my class the other day, this is like teaching CP24. There's stuff going all over the place. I can't, you know, uh, so you're trying to monitor the chat and you're trying to see who's on and who's off and who's raising their hand and blah, blah, blah. And it's very different in this two-dimensional sort of uh, screen trying to figure out what's happening. And that is really stressful. It's stressful for everybody in that class, right? Everybody is getting tired trying to deal with a three-dimensional, multi-dimensional education experience and this sort of two-dimensional platform. So that knowledge that it's that sort of extra layer of difficulty, I think it's helpful for parents to be aware of that. Teachers need to hear from the parents, obviously, but just be aware that that teacher is dealing with a lot. The teachers are aware that parents are dealing with a lot because a lot of them are parents. <laughs> and it just needs to be this sort of two-way thing that everybody recognizes, okay, this is a weird situation. We need to deal with this. The most important thing is this, how this child learns or this youth learns, and we're in it together. The worst thing you can do is go in being antagonistic because then, you know, nobody responds well to that. Um, yeah, that would be my biggest suggestion. Awesome. So I thought that was going to be our last question, but we have two more that just came in. So I do want to ask okay. them um, if you'll if you'll indulge us with uh, a little bit more of your time, um, and and it applies specifically to educators and teachers. So um, Nicola's asking, uh, did any of your participants comment on how they addressed some of the gaps in their own education or training that enabled them to effectively teach in the emergency distance format? Right, yes, and they did. And in fact, when I designed the study, I thought that was going to be the biggest issue. The biggest issue actually ended up being that, you know, they just missed their kids so much. But it turns out, I mean, teachers are professionals, they adjusted. Um, what they did was they helped each other. That was the biggest thing that um, they formed groups and divided up the work and helped each other. Um, we happen to be in a world where there's lots of stuff on YouTube. So a lot of them did that. Um, a lot of schools had uh, instructional coaches or people that were just sort of known as being good at doing tech and they became the resource people and the principals sort of created a way for them to be able to help their colleagues. So that was the main way they dealt with things. There were courses that were run um, that were available. Pretty well every school board did that. But the thing about courses is that they're so generic that if you need to know something now about this specific thing, then the course isn't going to get you there. So the courses, I mean, it's good that they were there, but the main way that teachers adjusted to all the technical changes was by helping each other and also by sort of leaning on um, the online sort of YouTube things that were posted. It's also the case that globally, a lot of teachers started posting solutions. And so that ended up being a way of sharing things. There were Facebook groups, for, it, for example, and YouTube channels that were started. So I would say that it, it ended up being that because they're professionals, they just adjusted technically. That, that didn't end up being the biggest problem that they had to deal with. Right. Right. And uh, one thing that, that uh, our audience might not know is that um, about a couple of years ago, there was an alumni network uh, formed for education. So there is a group of 
York alumni that have formed an alumni network. And uh, that might be another good venue for people to share. So if anyone um, offline, if anyone wants more information about that, please feel free to reach out to me directly. I can give you more info. I'm going to turn to our last question coming in from Eleanor. And Eleanor says, great idea to get kids to choose ways to show that they're present if they don't want cameras on. Can you give examples of concrete ways that you've heard or experienced? And Eleanor says that they teach mostly grade 11 and 12, and it was very strange with cameras off. I think that that brick wall that you put up really, uh, really, really speaks to that. So can you comment? Concrete ways. Yeah, so some concrete ways were per participating in the chat. Um, another, and this one was huge, was the reactions button. So that they would, you know, show that they're smiling or or that they agree or whatever through those reaction buttons in the Zoom. And there's probably something equivalent in other platforms. Those are the two main ones. Other ones were, you know, pretty traditional, actually raising their hand, asking questions. These are the things that they were saying. Um, and also they suggested um, that they liked being put in groups because then when they're put in a group and they're given, say, a Google um, doc to work on, then they're producing a product together. And they said, well, that's another way that we can show that we're participating. So you could do, I mean, it's in a classroom when you're face-to-face, -face, doing a brainstorm as a class is, is doable, but it's not really doable um, online because it's just too easy for people not to participate. So to really use the small group as much as you can, but lean on the things that are already part of the platform, such as the reaction button, that's a big thing. And it is actually, it is actually helpful once they get into the habit, um, then you can see, oh, they're actually paying attention. That's nice, you know. Um, it feels better to teach them when you're seeing uh, nothing but names and get a few of those reactions coming up. It's, it's helpful. Absolutely. Well, I think um, if our audience had access to post their reaction buttons, there would be a lot of thumbs up and hearts and, and all kinds of good vibes coming your way. Um, I can see that none of our participants who, who came have left. So clearly your message is resonating with this group. And we are very grateful, Professor Barrett, to you uh, taking your time to, to be with us, answering our questions and, and for the work that you do. Um, it's, it's absolutely vital. So thank you so much on behalf of all of us. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. So uh, at this point, you can turn off your video and, uh, and, and we'll say goodbye. And I'll just wrap things up for our audience. Um, thank you. So to our audience, thank you for taking the time to join us today. We do have one last poll question for you. So the question is, how would you rate your knowledge of today's topic following our discussion? So it's popped up on your screen. I'll give you a moment to respond. Great, thank you so much. So join us next week on October 6th for Creating Opportunities for Youth with the Kindergarten to Industry, K2I Academy at the Lausanne School of Engineering. And then we'll return on October 20th in partnership with Glendon College with Gertrude Mianda, Professor of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies. So for information about these and other events, Please, as always, visit our website at yorku.ca forward slash alumni and friends. I thank you all for being with us today and be well.